that I'm here uh, to talk about the, um, the agony and the ecstasy of being an entrepreneur, the trials and the triumphs. Um, for me, the journey started when I was 18, in 1980. Uh, I was studying medicine as an undergraduate at Oxford. Uh, I got involved with entrepreneurship by accident. Uh, I was all set to pursue a career as a doctor. And um, I was doing, as Mike referred to earlier, what most students do much of their time, which is uh, getting drunk and holding parties instead. And um, because I was doing that a lot, the people in charge of discipline at my college said they would kick me out unless we stopped. So rather than stop the parties, what me and my colleague who became a business partners for a couple of decades did was go to the local nightclub, which was shut on a Monday evening, and suggest that we could fill it for them on a Monday evening, and that in return for the money they'd get over the bar, we would be allowed to charge on the door. So our parties became a business, and um, we sent, spent weeks marketing it. There's no such thing as the internet then, obviously, so it was all about sort of leaflets and stickers and posters. And I can remember turning up 20 minutes before we were due to start at 8 o'clock, and there was a queue of about 15 people outside, all ready to come to our event that we had sort of conjured out of our imagination. And I think I really knew then that that was what I wanted to do, uh, run and own and build businesses. Um, and so that was when my uh, sort of decision was made, really. Uh, I, you know, uh, I think I, I thought the excitement, the drama was uh, better than academia, if you like. Uh, so after that epiphany, I started plotting. Uh, I did finish an undergraduate degree. I then worked as a stockbroking analyst for a few years in my 20s, uh, but all the time moonlighting with various operations, weekends, evenings, holidays. Uh, I had all sorts of stuff from a diet software business. Uh, do come and sit down here at the front, the space. Uh, restoring classic cars, E-type Jags. Uh, I got into a business reselling share registers, the names on them, uh, building theatre sets for the West End stage. Uh, there's a seat down here right at the front. Uh, none of those projects was conspicuously successful. In fact, I think it's probably fair to say they were all resounding flops. Uh, but actually, by then, it was too late. I was hooked on the idea of being my own boss. So in 1989, I took the plunge finally and became full-time self-employed. Uh, now, actually, my timing was very poor because Britain was about to go into quite a serious recession, um, but I'd already made the commitment, so it was too late to stop. Um, and in my experience, once you've actually made that commitment to become your own boss, it's actually very difficult to go back to the world of employment. Um, so no turning back. Now, I was lucky. I was you know, in my mid-20s, so I didn't have the responsibilities of a spouse or children and, um, you know, if I had uh, gone broke, you know, I could have picked myself up again and no one else would have got hurt. Uh, I think it's a lot easier if you do it that way, I have to say. Because um, the truth is, failures are rarely fatal and most of them are actually unimportant. Uh, I've certainly had quite a few. Uh, I like to call them tough lessons. It sounds a bit more pleasant than failure, doesn't it? Um, and ideally, you try not to make the same mistake twice. Um, I could talk to you about some of the highlights, or should I say lowlights, of things I've got wrong. So, for example, there was the occasion when um, I and my colleagues spent $5 million on opening a Belgian mussels and chips restaurant in Manhattan. Uh, unfortunately, our partner in this project, it was a joint venture, was a large US restaurant group that proceeded to go into chapter 11 halfway through the project. So we suddenly had no partner. Uh, we chose the wrong location. We were about five years too early in this part of downtown Manhattan. Uh, we hired the wrong manager. Uh, we didn't use union labor to construct the building. And uh, so we were picketed by uh, the construction <coughs> union and they stuck a giant 25 foot inflatable rat outside our entrance on our opening night, 
for the launch party. So you can imagine that had a bit of a, a negative effect. Um, and uh, we lost everything on that. Um, then rather more recently, uh, and I mean, I'm just picking some examples of things that haven't worked, uh, I got involved with the food production business where I invested as a um, financial backer um, and the owner entrepreneur um, uh, was running the business and needed some capital. Um, and I sensed quite early on, within a few months, I think probably, that the numbers weren't quite right. I got management accounts, but they were, didn't seem to add up. They didn't reconcile. And it all started to fall into place suddenly as to why the cash didn't quite balance because I got an email out of the blue a bit later from my uh, as well partner, uh, the operator, saying, Dear Luke, I'm afraid I'm no longer going to be able to uh, run the business uh, because I'm both an alcoholic and addicted to cocaine. Um, so that was quite a blow in terms of the prospects for the business. Um, <coughs> and then um, there was a scenery making business I mentioned earlier, which built sets for the West End. Um, this was some time ago, and in those days, amazingly, I don't believe it could be possible now. There's two seats down here at the front, if you want someone to sit. Um, our auditor was also the finance director of the business and sat on the borders of the finance director. And so, curiously, the numbers didn't add up because there was no one to check that the numbers were straight or not. Uh, so when we let him go, uh, we were required to restate the accounts for three years. And instead of, going, uh, instead of showing decent profits, they actually went into significant losses. Um, and then rather more sizably, not that many years ago, um, I thought I could turn back the tide of e-tailing, e uh, and I took control of a uh, failing biggish chain of bookshops called Borders in this country. Um, and I was arrogant enough to think I could compete with Amazon and e-books and supermarkets and so forth. Um, I thought I bought the business very cheap at a big discount. I thought it was you know, going to be a very straightforward turnaround, uh, <coughs> terrible misjudgment and uh, deep structural problems in that market, I'm afraid. Very sad, because I do love books and bookshops. Um, and my plans were doomed from day one. So I had to walk away from that, losing everything. So I've certainly had my fair share of uh, disasters, but I keep pressing on. I think like most entrepreneurs, all the research I've ever done is, uh, it's about the freedom and the independence. Uh, and I think entrepreneurship's hard to beat in terms of a career. That's one of the things you're after. Um, and it means never giving up. Um, on the upside, in early 1993, I became chairman of a business called Pizza Express. Uh, at the time, it was a fabulous brand, but underexploited. It had 12 company-owned restaurants and a couple of dozen franchise branches. Um, the business had suffered in the recession. The, it was a private business. The owners had fallen out, and so they put it up for sale. Uh, it made its first ever loss in 1992. Um, so I, I put together a consortium with a partner. We bought control of the business. Um, I think it was fairly remarkable. We were taken seriously at the time. I was a 29-year-old with an overdraft. Um, but anyhow, we obviously had a bit of self-confidence. We had something of a business plan. Um, as Mike mentioned, we, we took the business public uh, the next year at 40p. Um, the shares rose to over nine pounds. We grew the number of restaurants from 12 owned to 150 plus. We bought in all the franchises. Um, it was a great uh, piece of luck, our timing. There's a spare seat here at the front if you want someone to sit. Um, Britain was ready for something better. We were actually number four in the pizza restaurant market. At the time, there was Pizza Hut, Pizza Land, Deep Pan Pizza, and then us. Uh, in the 10 years we grew, while well, I was involved, Deep Pan Pizza went broke, and so did Pizza Land. We became number one. Um, and so by 1999, I had uh, sold most of my shares, and I thought my work was done. So uh, I stepped down, and I used that 
uh, success at Pizza Express as a springboard to do other things. I co-founded a business called Integrated Dental Holdings, which became uh, easily the UK's largest dental surgery business. Um, recently valued half a billion pounds. Unfortunately, I sold my shares a bit before that happened, but I did okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, I became one of the principal owners of a retailing business called Tops Tiles, which is the dominant specialist tile retail chain in this country with about 300 stores. I created from scratch a follow-on business, restaurant business in the pizza game called Strada, which we built up and sold pretty successfully. I think it's got about 75 branches now. I don't own it currently. Um, and then uh, about nine years ago, I got involved with a little business of six restaurants called Giraffe. And over the years, we grew that to be 50 branches, and we sold it earlier this year to Tesco. Um, and then, as was mentioned, I bought seven years ago a six-strong chain called Patisserie Valerie, uh, and we've taken that from six to 125, 126 branches as of tomorrow. Um, and our projected profits <coughs> this current financial year will be uh, 15 million pounds as opposed to the turnover when I bought it, which was five million pounds. Um, and I think these adventures, good and bad, have only been possible because of the world of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think in that uh, world, that journey, I think it's confirmed to me that the idea that, you know, reaching for the stars is not a form of madness, but is actually or can be a worthwhile endeavour, <coughs> is important. Because I think if you do have energy and ambition, you should take the plunge in life rather than live a life of regrets, uh, even if the odds seem unfavourable. Because as Lawrence of Arabia said, all men dream but unequally. Those that dream at night in the dusty recesses of their minds awake the next day to find that their dreams were mere vanity. But those who dream during the day with their eyes wide open are dangerous men. They act out their dreams and make them reality. And I do think those who own and operate companies are a somewhat distinct breed because they do adopt a very different approach to their work to most people. Um, now, I write a weekly column every Wednesday in the Financial Times on this whole subject of entrepreneurship. Um, and so on the back of thinking hard about the subject and obviously spending most of my time working with entrepreneurs and trying to grow entrepreneurial businesses and what have you, uh, I've come up with my list of 20 entrepreneur maxims. So here goes. Maxim number one. I think the most important motivating force for entrepreneurs is the desire for autonomy, not money. First and foremost, they look for independence and freedom in their work. They want to be free of bureaucracy and office politics, which tends to plague, plague larger companies and institutions. Yes, they want to be rich, but more than that, they do want to control their own destiny. They want credit for their own efforts. Maxim number two, a sense of optimism is a precursor to being an entrepreneur. Cynics and pessimists need not apply. I think you have to believe in the possibility, as Churchill once put it, of the sunlit uplands. Uh, risk takers, as a breed, desire gain more than they fear loss, which is the opposite of the large majority of the population. And they are willing to make the sacrifice from a life of security for the excitement, satisfaction, a roller coaster, and the uh, rewards of victory if their initiative succeeds. Maxim number three enterprise is not a zero sum activity. Now, socialists entirely miss this fundamental point. Entrepreneurs understand it intimately. Capitalism involves, the socialists believe capitalism involves transfers only. What they fail to see is that entrepreneurs, inventors, and such like add value and create wealth. And indeed, generally speaking, the more entrepreneurs there are, the better. That's why I'm in favor of more entrepreneurs, and I'm very keen if all of you want to become restaurateurs, because I think we'll all do well. Well, we may not all do well, but I think we'll all do better net. Because although competition is hard to bear at times, it's what drives improvements and drives quality. And if you ever go to places where there are monopolistic systems, then you almost inevitably get stagnation 
incompetence and corruption. They go together inevitably. Maxim number four, industries and economies move in cycles. Uh, what this means is that downturns and recoveries for the individual entrepreneur are almost inevitable and almost unavoidable. Um, and it's certainly much harder to make progress in the slump, so the last five years, however, the good thing is certainly in this country, we are now definitely in a recovery, so it's going to be easier going. Next year will be a good year to be an entrepreneur, I think. Uh, and the best entrepreneurs, of course, carry on regardless and are able to grow almost whatever because they realise they occupy their own micro-economy, which is what really matters rather than the macro situation. Maxim number five, I have always worked with business partners. Now, there are some entrepreneurs who, you know, Donald Trump or whatever, like to do it by themselves. I've always teamed up with others. Everything I've ever done, I've had one or more partners. Spreads the responsibilities. It makes the journey more fun. And uh, in the ideal world, you find someone or several whose skills complement yours. Um, so, for example, at Giraffe, I had Russell Joffe. Uh, I had David Page and others at Pizza Express. Um, I had my partner Tom Molnar at Gales Bakery, a business we own. Uh, Stuart Williams and Barry Bester at Topps Tiles and so forth. And I've been very lucky in that I've partnered, I think, with a number of outstanding entrepreneurs in my career. And I think they are the principal reason why I've had any successes. They've all been equity owners whose interests, financially and otherwise, are essentially aligned with mine. Maxim number six, I believe in the concept of domain knowledge. Uh, that means I much prefer to work with partners and entrepreneurs who are expert managers who have understanding and deep experience of their particular industry. I don't really believe in the idea of a general manager. I think the specialist technical competence, reputation and connections do matter. Um, Every sector does require regular infusions from outside of fresh blood, but I think there is no substitute in business for practical involvement with a solid operator. Maxim number six, uh, seven, I like a concentrated portfolio. So I don't really believe in the mantra of, of diversification. I focus my entire investments in really a small handful of companies, mostly in a small, narrow range of industries, mostly in one place, this country. Uh, I think it helps bring focus. Uh, I don't really understand, personally, the model of fund management where investors, fund managers might have a portfolio, portfolio of 100 holdings or more. Um, I think this concentration suits my personality. I think it gives you a lot more engagement with the companies you're involved with, which I think makes it much more pleasurable. Uh, maxim number eight, I think leaders of firms need to do three things well above everything else. They need to hire the right managers, they need to motivate those people, and they need to allocate capital intelligently. I think if you do those three duties efficiently, I think the rest is relatively unimportant. So all undertakings of scale beyond a one or two person business uh, rely on delegation and it's finding those lieutenants and incentivizing them which is vital. <coughs> and then obviously choosing which projects to back and which projects to ignore or neglect. That can never be left to others. Uh, so I believe those are the three priorities. If you get those wrong, then you're almost certain to fail. <coughs> Maxim number nine. I've found in my career that patient money tends to get the best results. Uh, I don't really uh, accept the theory of momentum trading or indeed hedge funds very much. Uh, I remember when I chaired the Channel 4, I was six years the chairman of Channel 4 Television, and I chaired the pension fund as well there, and we used to get pitches from hedge fund managers, and uh, I always used to ask what was their typical holding period, and very often it was a few months or less. And to me, that simply isn't investment, I think that's speculation. Uh, I'm very old-fashioned about this, uh, but my experience of growing companies uh, is that good ones uh, develop gradually um, and they need steady nurturing over the long run. Maxim number 10, uh, probably the most important single influence that fosters entrepreneurship 
uh, are role models, not legislation, governments, politicians. I think a very good predictor of whether someone is going to run their own business is if there are close examples at home of business owners when you're growing up at the kitchen table. You will then see that as a valid option in life. Um, I think entrepreneurship, this is the wrong place to be saying this, entrepreneurship is much more about culture than formal education. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the formal education, but the truth is that I think most entrepreneurs uh, are not necessarily, or at least many of them, are not necessarily good at uh, traditional scholarship as such. Uh, their skills lie elsewhere. Um, Maxim number 11, I like obsessives. I much prefer an individual who's a workaholic, uh, who fails to get their work-life balance right, than someone who's idle. Uh, I've met a lot of higher achieving entrepreneurs over the years, and most possess, to a greater or lesser extent, the characteristic of a one-track mind. Now, ambition by itself is useless, uh, because it just leads to dissatisfaction. Uh, it's got to be accompanied by talent and due diligence, uh, and diligence and discipline. Uh, so don't ever expect entrepreneurs to be the perfect Renaissance men or women. Uh, business success does not tend to emanate from the perfectly rounded personality. Uh, maxim number 12, execution matters a great deal more than theory. Uh, I'm sure all of you can write a great business plan, but not all of you can necessarily carry it out, and that's what really matters. So give me one operator with hands-on ability who can get business done rather than a strategist any day of the week. It's surprising, actually, how well slick talkers can be at raising money. But too often they tend to get found out that there's no substance behind all that charm because it's all about the follow-through. Maxim number 13... Entrepreneurs work hard, stating the obvious. This isn't the life if you want to get rich quick. I think you'd do much better to be a derivatives trader. Uh, I didn't go on holiday much throughout my 20s. I waited until I was in my 40s before I started family. Uh, so I certainly made some forfeits. Um, and I don't have a lot of time, to be honest, for would-be entrepreneurs who aren't willing to put in the hours and who are more interested up front in the material rewards and what they're going to do if they sell their business. That's not why people are successful in entrepreneurship, in my experience. Maxim number 14, all my returns have come from my big winners. As I discussed earlier, I've had plenty of flops, uh, but actually they're not significant in the grand scheme of things. You can make mistakes. The key fact to remember is that in equity investing, you can only lose your stake, assuming you haven't given a personal guarantee. But your upside, in theory, can be unlimited. And certainly, if you have a big hit, and I think entrepreneurship is like showbiz, a hit business, then a 100 times multiple of your original stake is by no means an impossibility. A maxim number 15. Most entrepreneurs are restless by nature. Uh, many of them are very brilliant at building businesses, starting things, but weak at supervising the status quo. They like dynamic conditions. Uh, and running the day-to-day -day activities bores them. Uh, and often they need to team up with a partner who will be more comfortable with the administration and repetitive tasks. I think it's the inquisitive stream in the typical entrepreneur uh, because they want to explore and pursue adventure. Uh, they find safety dull. Disruption and challenge are what interests them. And that's why, at heart, I think entrepreneurs are anti-establishment. They're always looking to upend what there is and replace it with their ideas. Not all of which are right, of course. Uh, maxim number 16. Uh, the most impressive firms I've come across and worked with are those that adopt a philosophy of Kaizen, even if they don't know what the word means. Um, my interpretation of this management method is a policy of endless small improvements, most, if not all of them, initiated from the bottom up. Uh, this means lots of small details adding up over time to a better business combined with an openness to incremental change and an idea that never enough. There are always more improvements to be made. And I think that fits in with the idea that it's an ev evolving thing, a great business. It's not a static thing. 
That's where innovation comes from, not big leaps, in my experience. Maxim number 17, human nature tends to shine the spotlight on one man or woman, the top, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, whatever. But actually, virtually all the finest firms are constructed by teams, not individual people. For example, at Pizza Express, we grew it during the 90s by 15, 20-fold because we had a whole team of us on the top. Uh, all of us were quite substantial shareholders. We had different roles, and we all, I think, added value and also benefited from the success. Um, I think this cult of a genius boss as an individual is very unhealthy. I think it's inaccurate, and I think it creates a more divided system generally. And I think it leads to excesses like employee chief executives, or indeed founder chief executives for that matter, being paid 200 or even 500 times what the lowest paid or average employee earns. I think that's both bad for capitalism, and I actually think it fails to deliver for shareholders. Maxim number 18, I think phil philanthropy and volunteering should be part of the mix. Uh, I've been lucky in that for the last 10 years or so, I've been able to devote roughly a day a week to good causes, uh, be they things like Channel 4, be they the RSA, which I chaired, uh, a new appointment I took up earlier this year, the Institute of Cancer Research. I think giving time and perhaps even money to those sort of non-profits helps broaden the mind and I think it complements one's work as an entrepreneur. Uh, obviously a lot of entrepreneurs get involved in founding charities or social enterprises, I think that's perhaps even better. Um, Maxim number 19, I think lifelong learning is part of the entrepreneurial process. Uh, those elderly entrepreneurs I know who seem the happiest are those who are still acquiring knowledge even if they're not very active in business uh, and they maintain the zest for the world. Uh, I think entrepreneurs are very fortunate in this regard is that they can actually roam around, they can seek new products or markets or even companies and investigate them and seize seize the day, uh, and I think it's a very positive way to accumulate experiences and indeed hopefully make a living. Um, maxim number 20, entrepreneurs matter. They create the majority of the new private sector jobs and all the surveys show that the most important thing for most people around the world in every walk of life is getting a good job. Entrepreneurs also punch above their weight in terms of innovation and tax generation. And that's partly why we launched the think tank that you had mentioned earlier, the Centre for Entrepreneurs, to research entrepreneurship and to educate politicians, the media and citizens about the importance of entrepreneurs to our economy, culture and standards of living. So to sum up, I think we should never let temporarily difficult conditions blind us to the wonderful opportunities that will always await those willing to try. And I constantly try to remember that most of us are actually disappointed or more disappointed by the things we didn't do in life than by the things we did, even if they went wrong. As Teddy Roosevelt said, one of my favourite presidents, in a speech in Paris 102 years ago, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. That credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who has, actually does strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Obviously, you can substitute she for he there. So I think success is being about vitally engaged in something you consider worthwhile, making a difference for the better, and enjoying life while you're at it. And those whom I've met in my 30-year career in entrepreneurship, whom I most admire, and who seem to me to achieve lasting success, do remember also to volunteer, and remember philanthropy, remember to create things where they can, remember decency and balance, and remember to remain captains of their souls. Thank you very much for listening, and good luck in your endeavours.